Thank you very much, Your Honor. What I would like to do is put forward the case on behalf of my client, the Planet, which has provided a very accommodating and beneficial environment for humanity to develop. But now we face a different situation. A quick geological background. This is how my client has operated over the last half million years, based on ice core data from Antarctica. And I've mapped on here the uh, evolution of humanity itself, which is about halfway through this record. This red line in the middle is, in fact, a record of temperature, global average temperature. And you see that during most of the time that humanity has been on the surface of my client, it has operated in very small numbers and as hunter-gatherers, and indeed, the genetics of humanity is still wired for that type of operation. It's only in the last 10,000 years, this little bit at the right, and I'm not sure if I've got a uh, laser pointer. I don't think I do. But you see, just at the right, there's an unusually long warm period in this very graceful uh, dance between ice ages and warm periods. And it's only during this last 10,000 years or so, called the Holocene, that humanity has been able to develop agriculture, develop villages and cities, the contemporary civilization that we enjoy. So this is the environment that my client has provided for humanity. And indeed, without interference, this would continue for another 20 or 30,000 years before the orbit of the Earth around the sun would trigger another ice age. So we have a long way to go without interference. But what's happening now? Well, I can see what's happening to my client's operation. There's the nitrogen cycle, pre-industrial, post-industrial. All you have to do is look at the size of the arrows to see the change. These are the rivers that used to flow freely to the sea that have now been dammed and no longer flow freely to the sea. This is the amount of the Earth's land cover that has now been converted to cropland. And of course, previous speakers have already talked about the fact that the climate on the surface of my client is already starting to change in ways that threaten the viability of humans. And of course, there's the uh, most prominent evidence. Uh, my temperature is going up away from the Holocene uh, envelope of variability. Now, we can look at this even more systematically. Let's turn the focus first uh, on the defendant, humanity. What we've done here is to go from before the Industrial Revolution, the year 1750, to the year 2000 and look at how humanity has changed. There's population in the upper left, there's economy, direct foreign investment, there's some resource use, damming of rivers, which I've noted, fertilizer consumption, so on. Uh, then we look at, at McDonald's restaurants, which from a planetary point of view is actually a good indicator for connectivity or globalization and communication. Look what stands out, the year 1950, a remarkable change in the operation of humanity after the Second World War. In areas where there was already activity, like population, the rate increases. But in many things, like communication and transport, there was virtually no activity of any sort at the global scale until after the Second World War. We call this the Great Acceleration. And this is really what has propelled the Earth out of the Holocene and into the Anthropocene. And as a matter of fact, the Geological Society of London, the timekeepers of the planet, are now initiating a formal process by which the geological community will formalize the fact that the Earth has left the Holocene and is now in the Anthropocene. And here is the environmental evidence on the same time scale as we saw for the human enterprise. The famous greenhouse gases all going up already outside Holocene envelope of variability. Ozone depletion over the pole, again, outside of, of uh, Holocene variability. Temperature, great floods. We're still debating on whether it's left the Holocene um, uh, envelope, but there's no doubt which direction it's going. And then some direct impacts of humans on ecosystems, marine, coastal, terrestrial. The lower right one's important. We are losing species now at an increasing rate, and many people who are experts in this field say that the planet is now entering the sixth great extinction event in its history, but the first one that's actually been caused by a biological species rather than a geological event. Let's take this apart a little bit. Those were global aggregates. We have a very unfair situation. Just look at the top two. Population. Look at the last 40, 50 years. The blue wedge are the wealthy countries. The red wedge is the developing world. Almost all the additional humans on the planet come into the developing world. The wealthy countries change hardly at all. But look at the economy. Still, despite the rise of China and India, still dominated by the wealthy countries, 80 percent 
of the world's economy resides in the wealthy countries. That is what is driving those environmental parameters. So we have a hugely unequal world in addition to a world that is pushing at planetary limits. This is a very interesting way of looking at it. This comes from National Geographic and it's that famous IPAT equation. The impact of humanity on Earth is some aggregate of population, how many we are, affluence, which is how much we consume, and technology, which is how we produce what we consume. Look at the size of that box. You can barely see down in the corner that little tiny wedge was 1900. The next little tiny wedge was 1950. 50 years from one tiny wedge to a second tiny wedge. The next 60 years gives you the big box. That's the great acceleration in a very stark way. All that stuff that sits in that box comes basically after the Second World War and is driven by 20% of humanity. And if we look at what's happening to the planet after the year 2000, CO2 still going up at an even faster rate, as, as John Schellenhuber pointed out. We're making our, our hole even deeper, uh, and temperature continues to rise, as basic physics say it should. That's absolutely no surprise whatsoever to scientists. All right, well, what do we do about this? Well, one way we can do about this is look at the Earth system in terms of what it provides for humanity. And you can look at it either as goods and services or as resources, two sides of the same coin. Ecosystem services have been around now for a decade or two. And I just take three types here. Provisioning, things we get, like food. Supporting, things like soil formation. And regulating, ecological control of pests and diseases. But we need to broaden this beyond the biosphere. We need to broaden it to the Earth system, which includes the cryosphere, the geosphere, the physical ocean, and so on. They provide services. They provide fossil fuels. They provide metals and minerals. They provide supporting services. Upwelling branches of ocean circulation brings nutrients to support marine ecosystems. Regulating ozone uh, formation in the stratosphere regulates the amount of incoming ultraviolet radiation. So the Earth system, beyond the biosphere, provides important services. We can already look at all of these as resources. Resources we use, like oil, and resources that sustain us, like the environmental resources that uh, operate in the Holocene. Let's take a look at some of these uh, resources or services might look like. Quick look at the ocean. Here is the carbon cycle. The wedge at the top are emissions into the atmosphere. The wedges going to the bottom are where that lands up. Obviously a lot in the atmosphere, but half of that carbon goes back into the Earth's system. And half of that half, a quarter, goes into the ocean. A big free service provided by the ocean. But this is complicated. It's taking up so much carbon, so much carbon dioxide now, it's actually acidifying at a great rate. One good service leads to one threatening risk. And you can see over the last 25 million years that acidity has changed, but just the last 200 from 1800 to 2000, already a huge change by geological perspectives in the acidity of the ocean. If we keep going on those trajectories that John Schellenhuber uh, showed, by 2100, coral reefs are gone. They're algal ecosystems. The biggest living organism, which sits off the no north coast of my country, will no longer exist as a coral reef. It will be an ecosystem, but an extremely different one. Another way of looking at these resources that we have is to say we have one planet Earth to use. Uh, here's the estimate of how much we're using. Somewhere around 1980, humanity started using more than one planet Earth. You might ask, how can we do that? We can do that by eating into the natural capital. You can live very well if you have a big endowment. You can live on more than the interest. And you can be very wealthy, your well-being will go up, but you are eating away from underneath the long-term wealth and sustainability you need to keep going. And that's precisely what we're happening. Right now, we're at about 1.5 planet Earths. If we keep going on the trajectories without change that we're on now, we will use about 2.5 planet Earths by 2050. If we all desire to live by like that 25 or 20 percent of the wealthy countries do now, we'll need five planet Earths. This is clearly not possible. This graph here, I think, addresses the third point. Business as usual, incrementality is that red line. That is simply not a possibility. Again, though, deep equity issues are buried in this. Here's the footprint again on the upper scale in a per person uh, 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 scale. That dotted line is how much each human can have of Earth's resources, a bit under two hectares. The horizontal axis is the Human Development Index. 
Humanity is improving its well-being. More people are being brought out of poverty. Longevity is increasing, and so on. And you can see these, these circles that represent countries, these dots are moving upwards and to the right. But what they're missing is the sustainable development quadrant where we have a high level of human well-being and we live within my client's resource base. We are simply not doing it. Only one country squeaks into the corner. So here's the problem. Many of the African countries, which are the poorest, live within the resources of planet Earth, but they need to develop further to improve human well-being. Those countries way up on the right, like the USA, like Australia, like most European countries, have long since passed the threshold of really good lives for humans, but they are way outside the bounds at which the planet can sustain indefinitely. So a few comments now before I close on three important issues. Where are we now as we go into the 21st century? Things are changing fast. Countries are developing rapidly, joining the wealthy countries. We are reaching hyperconnectivity. The world is really connected as we saw in the global financial crisis. Ironically, we're now almost able to, to be able to synthesize life. We've been able to take an artificial chromosome, which we have built chemically and insert it successfully in a bacterium. That's getting close towards synthesis. But on the other hand, we're exhausting resources. We're reaching peak oil, which has really supported all of this great acceleration, and possibly also peak phosphorus. Just a quick look. There are the projections by the people who know in the energy industry what's going to happen to oil production. If we haven't reached it, we're very close. And even if we haven't quite reached peak production, supply and demand is already out of kilter. Look at what's happening when it's out of kilter. You're starting to see a sawtooth pattern. Demand pushes prices up, economic recession, prices drop, start out of the recession, shoves prices up again, and we're starting a sawtooth pattern. But again, this underpins how we live on planet Earth now. Look at the next curve. Look at the shape of this really carefully. Now look at food prices. Do you see some similarity? There's been a lot of talk about how complex what's happening to food prices. I think it's actually much simpler than what a lot of people make out. Sure, there's, there's changes in how countries react, but this fundamentally underpins the food that supp supplies humanity today, oil. Biodiversity, all right, we're already almost able to synthesize life, but ironically at the same time, we're losing it at an enormous rate. We're 100 to 1,000 times already over the long-term extinction rate on planet Earth. We're headed for another factor of 10 or 100 this century as climate change really starts to kick in. We spend enormous resources to synthesize maybe one little bacterium, and at the same time, we're losing an incredible richness of complex life. That's one of the huge paradoxes of the 21st century. Okay, planetary boundaries. My client has a positive way forward. My client has supported humanity through its existence for 250,000 years. It's in fact provided an unusually long interglacial period, which has allowed humanity to develop villages, to develop the civilization we enjoy. And my client is prepared to continue to do that for another 20 to 30,000 years without interruption. This is a unique opportunity for humanity. But are we really taking advantage of it or are we squandering it by going too hard, too fast to make ourselves wealthy without thinking about what the future really means. So my client has a proposition. It says it has some intrinsic boundaries by which it operates. They're hardwired. The earth can't change it. Humanity can't change it. We need to recognize them. If we stay within these, we have many different possibilities to develop. And the defendant will explore some of those possibilities in a very positive way. What are some of those boundaries? Well, scientists on the earth have examined them. Climate change is a really important one. We focused on that. But you see the others around here. We've identified nine of them. They have to do with the big element cycles. They have to do with ocean acidity. They have to do with other aspects of the atmosphere. Importantly, land. A really important one, rate of biodiversity loss. We don't know how much biodiversity we can lose before resilience is really eroded. Well, where are we? Here's the problem my planet has with humanity. It says, look, this green area is the safe operating space. If you stay there, we, my, my client says, I can guarantee you a Holocene-type environment if you stay within there. Already, humanity has pushed the important parameters outside of that safe operating space in three important areas. Climate change on the top, a lot has been written about that. Biodiversity even further outside the bounds of where we ought to be. And the nitrogen cycle and possibly the phosphorus cycle. Ocean acidity is pushing at the boundary. It'll be outside very soon if we do not change our trajectory. 
This is another, another example, another piece of evidence why business as usual, incrementality. Look at those black dots. That's incrementality pushing outside the bounds, the planetary boundaries. So my client says humanity must change direction. And if it does, we can have a very prosperous future together. Tipping elements. I won't go into this in any more detail. John Shellenuber has, has already talked about it, except to say my client is sending you a warning. It's seeing that three of these are already moving in the early stages. Permafrost, methane, upper north. We're starting to see leakage. It isn't an outburst, yes, but it's leakage, and it's measurable. Stability of the Greenland ice sheet. More and more data is saying this is starting to accelerate. We're losing ice at a greater rate. We could be close to a threshold soon. Collapse of the Amazon forest. We've had two big droughts in the last decade. The second one has outgassed more carbon dioxide than it's taken 10 years to build up in that forest. There are warning signs. So humanity is getting a wake-up call. These are starting to be activated. Finally, again, I want to emphasize what complex system science and what physics says. We're not in a linear world. Look how clearly the Earth oscillates between two attractors or two basins of attraction. Short interglacials, and I just mentioned that we are providing humanity with an unusually long one just now, and rather longer ice ages. But humanity is pushing my client's environment upwards, not back into that so-called limit cycle, but outside of it, toward a much higher world. Well, what does this mean? Well, there's the CO2. There's the 400,000 year record of how carbon dioxide oscillates naturally. Look where we are. We've doubled the operating range, and we're still going up and the rate is increasing. There's temperature. Now I want to uh, do something that complements what John Schellenhuber did. He looked forwards. I'm going to look backwards because you'll, I want to see where we came from. There's the last thousand years of temperature oscillation with the air bars in the blue. That is the Holocene envelope of variability in which humanity has developed. You see where we are now. We've just poked outside, which is why we now start to see impacts of climate change. We are already committed to further warming, even if we cut greenhouse gases to zero tomorrow. But those are the IPCC projections on the same time scale as my planet operates. This is a warning sign. How far do we go up that before we do exactly what John said? We tip. We undermine e the resilience of the planet, and we tip into a warmer state that we actually can't come back from. So, this is all I want to say on behalf of my client, planet Earth, to say farewell from my planet. The Holocene has been wonderful. We hope that you have enjoyed it. And now we give you a challenge. You are in the Anthropocene, but the Anthropocene is a, is a dynamic phase. It's still moving. The proposition we put is if you try to get back to a Holocene-like set of conditions, my planet will cooperate and provide you with the wherewithal for humanity to continue to prosper. Thank you very much, Your Honor.